Good afternoon. As people continue to come in and get settled, uh, I wanted to welcome everyone to this afternoon's plenary. Um, until our hearts are on the ground, Indigenous women's activism now and forever. Uh, my name is Kelly Dowdell. I'm a very proud member of the board of the Parkland Institute, and I'm happy to see so many people here. And had been mentioning to our speaker, who I'll introduce in a moment, that I believe this session comes at just the right time uh, in the sequence of events um, from what we've heard so far. And so I'm very interested to hear the contributions um, that we'll hear from Dr. Don Lavelle Harvard. Uh, so she is a proud member of the Wikwemekong First Nation, the first Aboriginal Trudeau scholar, and she's worked to advance the rights of Indigenous women for decades. She served as the president of the Ontario Native Women's Association for 16 years and was elected president of the Native Women's Association of Canada in 2015. She's the director for First People's House of Learning at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. And there's a much more lengthy bio on page 13 of your program if you're interested in uh, learning more about her and her past and her experiences. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome her uh, to begin her presentation today. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. When you were asking how to pronounce Wee Quam Kong, don't feel bad, I know that's a struggle for many people. In fact, how many people in the room know where Wikwem Kong is? Okay. I'm amazed, that's one more than usual. <laughs> it's a First Nation community on a small island in Lake Huron in Ontario. But as I, as I said, it's not surprising very many people don't realize where that is. In fact, many years ago, when the Prime Minister of the country at the time came to our community, and it was about the middle of August he came, there was a big community opening of something, and middle of August, and they were all down on the marina, down by the waterfront, and it was a really hot day. And he was standing out there in his suit, and he was wearing this beautiful silver fox fur hat. And he's just sweating away, like <laughs> running down his face. And one of the, at the end of his speech, you know, he gave his usual on behalf of our great nation. And at the end of his speech, you know, they asked if there was any questions. And one little old lady, this elder, stood up and she says, Mr. Prime Minister, it's August. Why are you wearing a fox hat? And he says, well, let me tell you. When I tell my wife I was going to Wequem Kong, she says, Wequem Kong, where the fox at? <laughs> so I wear the fox hat. <laughs> that was always my grandmother's favorite story about the time the prime minister came to Wequem Kong. <laughs> Ani, Bojo, Sego, Sagoli, Skanagoa, bonjour, good afternoon. I figure if I keep going, I'll hit one that everybody knows eventually. Don Harvard, Dijnakas, Wequem Kong, Donjaba. I'm from the Wequem Kong First Nation, the Anishinaabek Nation. And I want to start today by acknowledging the original indigenous peoples of this land, specifically Treaty 6 on whose territory we're gathered here today. And we have the privilege of being able to gather, of being able to live and work on this land because of those people, because our people signed treaties, giving us the right to live together and enjoy this land moving forward. As was mentioned, I've been involved with Indigenous women's activism for over 40 years, and at the risk of disclosing too much about my age, I wanna say that I was actually the baby in my mother's arms when she was an activist. I was that child in a stroller on Parliament Hill when she was protesting. And our women have a long history. She wasn't the first one. Our women have a long history of being activists. And back before when it wasn't even legal for Indigenous people to gather together 
back when there wasn't allowed to have more than three indigenous people gathered together because the country was afraid that we would be inciting some sort of riot, some sort of rebellion. Our women got around that by having homemakers clubs. So they were still activists, but they called them homemakers clubs. And according to the Indian agent, they were gathering to learn to, about recipes or you know, how to get sweat stains out of their husband's collars. <laughs> you know, all these really important things that women needed to know. But when they closed those doors, they started talking about health. They started talking about running the communities. They started talking about education for our children. And my grandmother said, you know, in those days, they would get together and they talked about the need for improving the education for our children. And so when they said, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, you know, we have to send somebody to Ottawa to talk to the prime minister. We have to go to those governments and, and let them know what our children need. And she said, so they went and they talked to the chief and they said he was like one of those little wind-up toy soldiers. They turn them the right direction, wind them up and send them off to Ottawa. But it was our women. It was our women who were doing that activism. And it didn't stop. It went generation after generation. I was actually tricked into joining the Indigenous Women's Activism Movement. I thought I was going to the casino. <laughs> My mother called up one weekend when I was in, I think, about second year university. And she says, you know, come on, let's go to Sault Ste. Marie. Your auntie's going to be there. Your grandma's going to be there. And Sault Ste. Marie, everybody knows. You go to, go to Vegas, Kiwaden, and you're going to casino. So that's how I thought I was going. And I got there, and lo and behold, they're having an annual meeting of the Ontario Native Women's Association. And I get there, and she says, OK, all you youth, go down the hall, and you're meeting down there. So I went down to the meeting. I came out, and I was the youth member on the board. <laughs> and it all went downhill from there. But that's literally how it happened. After years of growing up, I guess it was destiny that I was going to be involved in this. And actually, quite recently, my own daughter has joined the board of the Ontario Native Women's Association. And she says that, you know, she figured she might as well just stop fighting it. <laughs> it was too hard to keep fighting. But our Native Women's Associations had a really important, like the formal organizational structure had a really important start. And it was back in the 1970s, and we know that this was a time of you know, civil organizing. Everybody was talking about justice, talking about social justice, a lot of movements. You know, there's a black power movement. Indigenous people were talking about our rights. And it was in the 1970s that my mom went to a coffee house at the Friendship Center and met a musician. They subsequently got married. Uh, but because he was not indigenous she lost her status. And when she lost her status, she lost her home. She lost her right to ever even return to her community. And because this only happened to Indian women, it didn't happen to our men. If the men married a non-Indigenous woman, she actually would gain status. She would get a status card. And even if they subsequently divorced or he passed away, she would forever be considered a status Indian with all the rights in our communities. And her children would have all of those rights. While our women who had the language, who had the culture, who were raising our children and holding our families and communities together were being kicked out of communities. And this was very deliberate, but she knew this was wrong. They knew this was discrimination. So when she was telling me about this story, she says, so I went to go talk to my friend Clayton Ruby. <laughs> Only my mother could just walk down the street and talk to her friend Clayton Ruby. And they realized that this was wrong. Because after she got married, she got a check, from a, a letter from the Canadian government, essentially saying, congratulations, you are no longer an Indian. Your name has been struck from the Indian registry. Here is a check for $35. Because apparently that's all being an Indian is worth in this country. And even with inflation, you know, that's still not very much. So, you know, she realized this was wrong. She never cashed that check. And she said that she was going to fight this. And they did. They lost at the county court. And they appealed it to the federal court. And they won because it was a no-brainer. It was clear discrimination. Women were being treated differently than men. Any five-year-old in kindergarten can tell you that's gender discrimination. That's discrimination based on sex. Very clear. Well, the Canadian government didn't like that outcome, and they appealed it to the Supreme Court. So this was the era I was growing up in. When we were going to the Supreme Court of Canada, you know, we had bake sales so we could raise money, because at the time, our own chiefs were siding with the government of Canada and speaking out against our women. They had all expenses paid, fancy hotels, big dinners, you know, plane trips, and our women would pile you know, as many as you could fit into a car, drive off to Ottawa, probably with bald tires, pray they get there. And my job at the time when I was little was they would check into, one woman would check into the hotel, and I had to go around the back and open the back door, and the other 15 would sneak in. <laughs> and we would all stay. And this was how they did it, though. 
This is how our women organized. They had nothing. And they'd had bake sales. They did fundraisers and raffles. I thought everybody <coughs> went to protests on the weekend. Who knew other kids played hockey? Arts and crafts night in my house was making protest signs and banners. <laughs> but this was the environment I grew up in. And at the time, when my mom was going to the Supreme Court, it wasn't easy. Even though the chief in our own community said, you're doing the right thing. These women belong in our community. These are our children and grandchildren. You need to stand up and fight this. And he said, but you know that when I leave here, when we go to Ottawa, I have to toe the party line and I can't support you. And he said, but you carry on. You keep going. And she did. Even when she had threats, we would get phone calls. She would get phone calls saying, if you carry on with this court case, you're going to start having accidents. And she said, I don't care. This is the right thing to do. I have to carry on. And so they waited. They would make phone calls saying, how would I come up there with my shotgun and see if you care? That didn't work because she stood up. And then they said, if you carry on with this, your children will start having accidents. And she said, it's for my children that I'm doing this and I'm not going to stop. And she didn't. They went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Interestingly, most people don't realize in what is now known as the Laval case, we actually lost by one vote because those brilliant Supreme Court justices let the government off on a technicality. And basically, one of them said, and it was recorded, that he didn't see that she had lost anything important. That we all know what it's like living on an Indian reserve. You should be happy that a white man would marry you. And that's the attitude. So those kind of attitudes, you know, you people should be happy a white man would marry you. Who does that sound like? <laughs> so this is not something new. That's the tragedy of it. It's not just buffoons in lightly colored jackets. It's, you know, supposedly educated men in long robes that are running this country have those same attitudes and those same attitudes that we've been fighting for a long time. Populism is nothing new. Those kinds of attitudes, we've been facing those since the beginning of this relationship. Okay, now this is where we get to see if we can make this work. There we go. When we talk, like Don Cherry, about you people, that's not just limited to public sports broadcasters. When we have the people who are running our country, when the whole notion of democracy is based on these people making decisions on behalf of all Canadians, and yet don't see the original Canadians as people, as real people. Ontario Finance Minister Jim Flaherty, his attitudes are not that rare. Thankfully, he was drowned out. Thankfully, People called him out on this, and he eventually had to apologize. But this is just the begin this is just one example of a long history. And when I was invited to come and speak here, I actually had a brief moment of what do I know about populism? I actually had to go look it up. Okay, wait a minute, what is this? But this notion, the idea of we the people, we the common man versus the elites. As Indigenous people, we have never been either. We're certainly not elite in this country, but we have never even been welcomed into that category of the common people. Throughout history, you know, we have seen processes that in fact legislatively made it impossible to be an Indian under the Indian Act in this country and still be a Canadian. Literally, the legislations in, with the enfranchisement, if you wanted to be a Canadian, if you wanted to have rights as a person under the laws of Canada, you had to give up your Indian status. You had to renounce being an Indian. So they created this binary structure where you could be an Indian or you could be Canadian and you could be a person. So it's worse than just you people. We weren't even people. It was you, not even people. So, you know, when we talk about the average Canadian, at Trent University right now, we have been engaged in this interesting social change project where somebody on the Senate committee made the brilliant decision that it's, and this is actually, it's well-intentioned, that all 
students at Trent University who started last September have to take one half credit in an Indigenous Studies content course. Great, great idea. The challenge is the minute you make something mandatory, even people who might have been interested, people who might have enjoyed that, all of a sudden when it's being forced down your throat, it's something we resist, something we resent. And last year, we had a whole year of dealing. I actually was instructor in one of the courses. And as we were standing outside waiting for the doors to be unlocked, one of the students was like, I don't know why I have to take this. And you know, this doesn't relate to my degree. And, and when we got into the classroom and I went up to the front and he just went, oh, jeez. <laughs> Because, of course, apparently I was not significant, sufficiently aged, gray-haired, or male enough to be seen as the instructor for this course. But that attitude we have been working to change. This year, we have gone through an exercise where in the first weeks of class, we've had about 1,200 students, because we did all of the sections of the Indigenous Studies class, 1,200 students in groups of about 40 or 50. We led them through a historic experiential exercise that teaches them about the real truth of history in Canada. The real truth about the treatment of indigenous peoples in this country. The real truth about colonization. And when we go through that process and where they see how our people went from this entire nation through a process of fraud, through a process of appropriation, through a process of outright lying and breaking the treaties and breaking the promises, went from the entire landmass of Canada to less than one half of 1% of this country. If you take all of the little spots of indigenous reserve land in this country, pile them all together, it still wouldn't even cover half of the Navajo reservation in Arizona. Half of one reservation. That's all that we have left. And so when our students go through this and they recognize, and all of a sudden, they're shocked. And they're angry because they say, we didn't know. They say, how did we go through an education system in this country? They're our university students. They're well-educated, privileged kids. And they say, how did we not know this? And I say, it's not your fault. It was deliberate. The system was designed so that you don't know. We have two weeks, maybe, about the Indians in grade three, where we talk about wigwams and teepees. Maybe. We have a teaching system that has teachers that come to me and say, I'm not really comfortable teaching about the history of indigenous peoples in this country because I might step wrong. So, you know, you're Autumn's mother, you're indigenous, can you come and teach this class? Which I do, and they're lucky because it's me. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> We had a case where, you know, they asked somebody's grandfather to come in. And as Indigenous people, we know that humor is very much a part of our lives. And so when one of the little boys put his hand up at the end and they, they asked for questions, and this little boy puts up his hand and says, do you have a wife? And this Nishnabe grandfather says, oh, I have many wives <laughs> and many, many girlfriends. <laughs> and so all of a sudden you have all these kids in Richmond Hill going home and saying, no, the Indi Indians in this country, they're polygamous peoples. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> And I know this because I was the one that was called in to do some, you know, damage control in this classroom after that. <laughs> the fundamental problem is that we have teachers that allow themselves, that we accept that it's okay for them to be not comfortable, to be ignorant about Indigenous history and not wanting to step wrong so they don't teach it at all or they hire somebody's dad. I mean, quite frankly, if I, well, when I was a grade three teacher, I'm not real good at fractions, but I don't get to say, I'm not comfortable with fractions, so we're gonna get Timmy's dad to teach this for the unit. No, it doesn't work that way. I have to be good enough. I have to be confident enough to be able to teach that history. And so that's what we're demanding, and that's what we need to demand of everybody in this country, is that we have to have that truth. If we're gonna talk about reconciliation, everybody wants to get to reconciliation. Everybody wants to know how do we do this? What does it look like? What's an action list? Give me something concrete I can do today. Usually I say, pull out your checkbook, please, and I can tell you where to sign. That's something concrete we can do. But it's not, that is the end point when we talk about reconciliation. The action items, you know, the TRC has hundreds of action items you can do. But oh, you're always missing that truth. It's the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, not the Reconciliation Commission. And yes, looking at that truth can be hard. It can be ugly. I've had students say, I feel ashamed of who I am because it was my ancestors that did this. And I said, you don't have to be ashamed. I want you to be proud of who you are. You want to wear a kilt, do it proudly. You know, no matter where you came from, 
Be proud of it. Own that. You are not responsible for the sins of your forefathers any more than I am for the sins of my father. And thankfully, like he was a biker, so I'm, I'm so not owning any of that. <laughs> but what you are responsible for is what you do moving forward, what you do now that you know and you cannot unknow that history of how our people were displaced, of how they lost everything, how they were put onto reserves, and how in this, you know, early examples of populism, that if the local settler community got too big, got too close to the Indian reserve, well, we'll just move the Indians further away. We don't need to build a wall. We'll just move them. Canada's huge, right? Like, we'll just keep moving them further and further away till they're in an area nobody wants. And then 100 years from now, we're going to talk about why do these people insist on living in these areas that are uninhabitable? <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't our idea. Should have thought that one through. Why do they live in houses and floodplains? Again, some guy in Ottawa with a map decided that's where the houses go, not somebody in that community. So because we're living with the fallout of hundreds of years of this, we're still in that position. We're struggling to survive in third world conditions in the middle of one of the richest countries in the world. And no, those people, you don't have to be ashamed of what your ancestors did. You have to know it. You have to understand it. You have to embrace it. You have to be responsible for what you do moving forward, what you do now with that privilege you have. The fact that we are all sitting here in this room, the fact, you know, when I have my students, the fact that we're all university students, that means you have a huge amount of privilege. And how do we use that to make society a better place for everybody? Because as we've said, you know, the system has been designed to work against Indigenous peoples right from day one. A system that said you had to give up being an Indian if you wanted to be a Canadian citizen. Indigenous peoples in this country were not considered persons under the law until the 1960s. 1960s. You know, women got the right to be persons back in the 1920s, unless you're an Indigenous woman. You know, this is the reality of what we were living in. Legislation that said, if you don't like the denial of your rights, well, you can't hire a lawyer because we've made that illegal too. And if you don't like that and you try to get together, well, we've made that illegal as well. So, you know, we want you to be farmers. They set up rules saying, we want Indigenous people to be farmers. You need to settle down, give up your nomadic ways. We've corralled you onto reserves for your own safety. We want you to be farmers. So our people, okay, you know what? I, I have to admit, the Anishinaabe were not great farmers. The Iroquois, much better. They're you know, very structured. They had lots of stores. They were very good at it. Uh, my grandmother's complaint is that the Anishinaabe, one of our, our usual process of uh, agriculture, was planting in the spring and then going off to our summer fishing camps and coming back in September and finding what was left. Um, actually sounds a lot like my garden this summer because <laughs> my children have horses and they're on these show jumping teams so I don't think I was home a single weekend all summer. So it was, you know, hunt through the weeds for the occasional squash if you can find it. So that's, and I told them that's tradition, that's culture, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but, you know, this, our people know this land. Our people knew how to survive. Our people knew how to grow food out of this land, out of these rocks, out of this barren territory. And so they did. Even when the government said, Indians are not allowed to use implements. You're not allowed to have farm tools. Even though they say we want you to be farmers, but we're not going to let you use farm tools. And even when we're like, all right, you know what? We'll farm with sticks. We can still grow. This is our land. We know how to do it. We still grew enough produce to feed our families and some left over to sell. And they're like, wait, wait, wait. That was not on the agenda. You are not, you know, we're supposed to be eliminating you people. And if you keep surviving and you keep finding ways to thrive, this is going against our whole project here. You know, trying to get rid of you people. So they made new legislation that said indigenous peoples, you know, Indians could not sell produce. They made that against the law. And if they tried to, decide to break the law and try to sell it anyways, they made it against the law for non-Indians to buy produce from an Indian. Fines of hundreds of dollars at a time when you could build an entire house for $300, buy a horse for $10. It was, you know, a $300 fine if you bought a potato off an Indian because they wanted to make sure we didn't survive. But I'm here today to tell you that after centuries of government programs designed to eliminate us, designed when they couldn't eliminate us, when they decided it was cheaper to feed the Indians than it was to fight them. And then somebody in the brilliance decided, well, actually, it's cheaper to educate the Indians than it is to feed them. And we'll create schools. And in those schools, those will be for assimilation, to get rid of the Indian and the child. That's how we're going to solve our problem. 
Did you know that kids in the residential schools had less of a chance of survival than soldiers in the world wars? Those are the educational opportunities. And at a time, you know, here's one for populism, early historic populism. Frank Oliver, who eventually ended up becoming actually the Minister of Indian Affairs federally in 1897, started to get upset that there, these schools, they were actually training our kids. They were coming out of there with skills as carpenters, coming out of there with skills as tailors, blacksmiths, cabinet makers, and they were, serving, they were really thriving. They were doing great. People started complaining, saying this is not an appropriate use of taxpayers' money. Frank Oliver literally said, we are educating Indians to compete industrial with our own people, which seems to be a very undesirable use of public money. This guy went on to become the Minister of Indian Affairs, who would be making the decisions about Indigenous people in this country. So when that's the attitudes, that we don't want to train Indigenous people, that we don't actually want to give them the opportunity to be a part of Canada, to be successful, to thrive instead of just sur barely surviving, you can see the situations we have, and you can see the circumstances we ended. But that's why, you know, today, Indigenous communities, we have the highest birth rates, because after hundreds, of, after hundreds of years, after centuries of trying to eliminate us, we are entitled to declare a victory because we are still here. We have survived, and that's a victory. <laughs> but we all know the tragedy that Indigenous peoples are facing in this country We've all just lived through the closing of the National Inquiry. And it's because of these decades of attitudes of us versus them, of not building walls, but pushing us into reserves, pushing us further and further back, denying opportunities to be part of the Canadian us and still be an Indian in this country. And I say Indian deliberately. I know that's actually not the politically correct term, but it is the legally correct term. It is still the Indian Act in this country. Be, to be an Indian was what my mother fought for. In fact, it was only about two months ago that the Canadian government has finally removed the last clauses of discrimination in the Indian Act and allowed our women and children and their grandchildren to be returned to their communities. Just after 50 years of fighting against something even a basic kindergarten kid could tell you was discrimination. But this was, so this was the, so why am I telling you all of this, right? We're like, wait a minute, we're, I, I've even lost track of why I'm talking about this. <laughs> and it's not just because I think my mom is great and I like to brag on her even though she is and I do. That's really not the point. The point is when we talk about indigenous peoples organizing, our women organized because there was nobody else to speak up for their rights. Even the national, I mean, the precursor of what is now the AFN at the time was called the National Indian Brotherhood, which tells you a lot about the flavor of that particular club. That's why our women had to create their own organizations. And when we did, we organized around this particular issue of status. But once we organized together as an organization, we started talking to our women and asking them, you know, what is the main barrier preventing you from having the same quality of life that you want, the same quality of life that other Canadians enjoy? And they said it was the violence. So back in the 1980s, we did a study called Breaking Free. And that, that report found that 75% of our women said it was the violence in their home and communities that was preventing them from living a good life. Some communities it was as high as 95%, especially the remote flying communities. Communities where they have, you know, we were at the UN and the Canadian government was talking about the 44 shelters they fund on reserves. Everybody thought that was great. Until somebody pointed out there's like over 640 First Nation communities in this country. So that means there's over 600 communities where women have nowhere to go if they are facing violence. Wow, and they're like, nobody told us that part. No, I bet they didn't tell you that part. But the violence in our communities is the result of these hundreds of years of colonization, of breaking down our families. In fact, it has become so normalized in our communities that when I was in Queen's University, one of my faculty, one of my professors invited me out for lunch. And I was a university student, so you go for free lunch anywhere, right? Sure, off we go. And we're at the restaurant, and he's, you know, good friends with the local chief. And the chief comes over and, you know, he introduces me that, you know, I'm with the Native Women's Association because I was a youth board member at that time. 
And he says, oh, you're with that ONWA group, those women's association. He says, I got a bone to pick with you. And I thought, oh, Lord, here it comes. Like, what have I done now? And he says, you know, you're always here in our community talking about needing shelters. And he says, you know, why don't you mind your own business? He said, when I grew up, yeah, if we stepped out of line, my dad would give us the strap. He said, if my mom disrespected, yeah, he'd put her right. He said, that's just part of being in a family. And I didn't know how to respond, because how do you respond to somebody whose experience in a family equates violence with ketchup? It's just something we all have in our homes, right? Everybody's got ketchup. Violence had become so normalized that he didn't see it as a problem. He said, our women were strong. They don't have to leave. And this was the attitude we were facing. So when we went to Kelowna and we wanted to talk about ending violence in our communities, the chiefs and the other organizations didn't even want to put it on the agenda. They wanted to talk about real issues like education and employment and economic development, thinking that you know, once everybody's got a job, then the violence is going to magically be solved. But we know that's not how it works. So we kept doing this. We kept recording. We were taught when we started Sisters in Spirit, we started with the names of 500 women who had gone missing or been murdered. And when we were up to 680, and people around the world, because we had gone to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, we had gone to the United Nations to talk about our stolen sisters. So people around the world were talking about the stolen sisters, about the crisis in Canada. And Canada was starting to get a real black eye internationally. You know, they put themselves out there as defenders of human rights, but they're ignoring what's happening right in their own backyards. So we were actually shut down by the Harper government, told us we could not do Sisters in Spirit work anymore. We could not use the name. We could not even use that term. Um, or the rest of our funding would be shut down. And we, do, we have education programs. We have employment programs. So everything we do for our women was going to be shut down if we kept doing this. But my dad will tell you, the fastest way to make sure a Anishinaabe woman does something is to tell her she can't. <laughs> so we did it anyways. The Harper government says we can't. Doesn't stop us. If we had to do it on our own volunteer time, we did it on our own volunteer time. We were up to 800 names. And these are just the ones we could find in the internet. And that's when the RCMP and the government started saying, well, you know, you are not real researchers. You don't have access to the hard data we're going to actually prove you wrong. And I hate to admit, they did prove us wrong. They came back with 1,181. They came back with even more than we had. And then how do they ignore their own national police forces statistics? And yet, while, every, you know, while the RCMP is talking about the high numbers, while the national Aboriginal organizations are calling for inquiry, you know, while the premiers of every province and territory in this country are recognizing this as a crisis. Former Prime Minister Harper continued to deny, deflect. He says this, is not, this crisis was not on his radar. But this is not just a women's issue, and this is not even just an Indigenous issue. This is a human rights issue. And that's what we need to remember when we're talking about this. We know that our women are more likely to be killed than non-Aboriginal women. The rates of spousal assault are three times higher than non-Aboriginal women. The most severe and potentially life-threatening forms of violence, more likely to be a victim of a serial killer. We've all heard this because we've all just gone through that national inquiry. But we ask ourselves, why is it that we're in this situation? It's that history. That history of historic populism, of us against them, of positioning indigenous peoples as not even human. There was this thing called the Doctrine of Discovery that the Vatican put out there that, you know, back in the beginnings before Canada was Canada, men were men. No, wait, that was a different speech, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Plain and simple, our women are at risk because they're women and they're indigenous in a country that has historically devalued, degraded, and dehumanized both of those categories. So when you have that intersection, the doctrine of discovery says that indigenous people have no souls because they're not Christian, they're not people. The Canadian government says the same thing. They're not persons until 1960s. You know, in, 19, or in 1749 in Nova Scotia, there was a proclamation issued offering because, you know, it was, getting, it was troublesome for the government, for the, you know, I think it was the lords in, in Britain at the time to try to eliminate this Indian problem. So they actually decided to get the locals involved, and they offered 10 pounds British sterling silver for the scalp as proof of the killing of any Mi'kmaq man, woman, or child. And when a lot of them were appalled and nobody was taking up, I said, look, they upped it to 50 pounds. 
This law is still on the, this is, this is in Canada. This law is still on the books in Canada. And when the chief said, you know, they want this repealed, the Canadian government said, well, you know, it's not really enforced anymore, so it's, it doesn't really mean. Like, these are the kinds of attitudes that we're facing. These are the kinds of attitudes that shape the environment where our women are subjected to violence, that shape the responses of police when we call to report one of our girls has gone missing. And they say, we all know what Indian chicks are like. She's probably just off getting drunk. She doesn't come back by next week. You have to wait 48 hours, our families are told, many, many times. But that's not true. In Canada, if a young girl, young boy, anybody goes missing, you, you, you can report it immediately. If my kid doesn't get off the bus at 4 o'clock, I could report them by 5 o'clock. I don't have to wait 48 hours. That's because we get a lot of our uh, legal knowledge from watching too much NYPD Blue and CIS and stuff like that. that that's an American thing. But our cops say stuff like this to our families. Or worse, they say, that's one less prostitute on my beat. That's one less welfare check my taxes have to cover. Which is interesting, because in this argument of us against them, of us always being the them, we're continually positioned against the common taxpayer, the average Canadian taxpayer, because everybody knows that Indians don't pay taxes, right? Well, that's a lie. I saw a study that showed, and, and this was actually when I was in university, that said that First Nations people, indigenous people who pay taxes, pay their income taxes, the amount they pay in income taxes to the government of Canada more than covers the amount that Canada spends on indigenous services in this country. Exceeds. So not only are we paying for all of our brothers and sisters back home, we're paying for everybody else a little bit too. So this notion that we're not taxpayers, this notion that we're somehow just a burden on society, on the average taxpayer, that populist conversation that has been justifying treatment of indigenous peoples for generations, it's just flat out not true. But it has a long legacy. And we know that because of these attitudes, our women are more likely to experience poverty, child welfare involvement, homelessness, domestic violence, sexual violence, child welfare, that's the biggest thing. Our kids are being taken away. I already did this one because I got my half hour. Because of this history, because of this history of colonization, of broken treaties, when the RCMP studied their 1,181 to find out why it is that indigenous women are going missing or being murdered at much higher rates, so they did their study and they looked at them and they said, well, indigenous women are twice as likely as non-indigenous women to have income from crime. And when you actually break it down, they had nice little pie charts and everything. And when you break it down, the numbers was 18% for indigenous women compared to 9% for non-indigenous women. And I thought, okay, that's double. And I thought, wait a minute, 18%. That means 82% of these victims were not involved in crime, did not have income from crime. So why are we focusing on that small portion? But then they said, wait, wait, wait. Indigenous women are twice as likely to be involved in the sex trade, so they're making lifestyle choices that is putting them at risk. 12% compared to 6% for non-Indigenous women. Again, 12%, that means 88% were not involved in the sex trade. 88% was, was a secretary, was working at the gas station or the local restaurant, or they were a student, or more importantly, 88% was somebody's mother, somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, somebody's niece, somebody's cousin. They're not just involved in sex. So we talk about this, but you know, they keep saying, it's indigenous women. They choose a high risk lifestyle. And I have to, on occasion, you know, that, okay, yes, our women have high risk lifestyles, absolutely. But not because they chose a high risk lifestyle. Our women have high risk lifestyles because they're born high risk. When you are born into a community that has no clean water, that has no hydro, that has no housing, that has no healthcare services, some of them don't even have schools. Basic things that we see as basic human rights in the middle of one of the richest countries in the world. Yes, our girls are at risk because they're born at risk when you're born into a community like this. And that's why we're in these situations. So when the Canadian government was called to the UN to report on the circumstances and they said, you know, this is not 
our responsibility. The violence against Indigenous women is being committed by individuals, not the government. The first time, one of the first times ever that the United Nations and actually the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights said that a country was committing a human rights violation not for their actions, but for their lack of actions, for their, no, their knowledge of a particular group being vulnerable and their failure to take action to prevent the violence and to protect vulnerable groups, that they had a positive obligation. <laughs> One of the first times ever said that the Canadian government was committing a grave human rights violation. When we talk about you know 40% of Aboriginal women living in poverty and more than half of all Aboriginal children. I always kind of wondered about these studies. You know, we're in a university setting. We talk about research methods. Studies of child poverty. Half of Indigenous children living in poverty, child poverty. I thought about this for a minute. Who are these children living with? We don't have children. We don't have little Peter Pan societies of lost boys, a bunch of little Indigenous kids running around the parks in the cities. Nope, nope. We don't. They're not living with moms who drive BMWs and work on Bay Street either. Ch indigenous children living in poverty are typically living with single parents, single mothers living in poverty. These are indigenous families living in poverty, but nobody wants to talk about that. The number one reason our women leave our communities is because of the violence, and when they get to the cities, they find it's that much worse. Now, when we talk about conceptions of child poverty, again, I work in the Faculty of Education. I train teacher candidates on when they have a duty to report. And we teach them. I mean, when I came into the system, I sat in the classes where they're taught. If you have a child who's coming to school with no lunch consistently, if you have a child who comes to school, this is Canada, I mean, this is Edmonton, right? So you have a child who's coming to school with no winter boots, no hat, no gloves, no warm winter coat, that's neglect, right? That's neglect. That's what we teach them. You have to call CAS, somebody has to go out, what happens, the child will be apprehended, put in foster care, that's how the system goes. But we have to start thinking differently because quite frankly, a lot of times that kid is going to school without a lunch, not because mom is too lazy, but because by the time they pay for rent, there's not enough left for food. And sometimes mom goes without food so that her kids have something in their lunches. I have three girls, and I go to the Dollarama every, uh, every October, and I buy about 20 pairs of gloves because I don't know how they can't make it through a week without losing them. <laughs> I swear, and then they take mine. But if you can't afford that first pair of gloves or that first hat, how do you replace it when your kid loses it? How do you keep your kids clean to send them to school when you're sleeping in a car or when you're sleeping on somebody's couch and you're surfing and you don't have somewhere to live at night? So yes, our kids are being reported, not for violence against them, but for neglect, which is actually poverty. And not that I want to use the US as an example, but I found out at one point that there are several US states, or there was at the time, I'm not sure, <laughs> things have been regressing pretty fast, that had legislation that said you cannot apprehend children for reasons of poverty. They had to prove as a social worker that they had provided up to X amount, it was sort of the equivalent of $60,000 Canadian, in supports to a family to keep them together to make sure they had food and warm clothes and shelter, somewhere to live, try to help mom get a job instead of apprehending. Can you imagine the difference we would have in Canada? Because right now, we know that we have more kids in the care of the child welfare system than we did in the height of the residential school system. And this is really critical because we also know that being involved in child welfare is the number one link to being trafficked in Canada. Everybody thinks of human trafficking as something that happens with container ships, you know, big containers, something in Eastern Europe or hot countries with lots of desert sand. It's not happening here in Canada. 95% of the victims of human trafficking in Canada are Canadian. They're domestic. Disproportionately, an overwhelming number of them are our girls. And all of the arguments that we've had recently about prostitution being criminalized, decriminalized, ab abolitionist versus legalization, is really all just a distraction. Because 13 is the average age that a girl is recruited into the sex trade in this country. That is not a grown woman making a decision about what to do with her body. That's child exploitation. That's child abuse. That's against the law, plain and simple. And so any other conversations are just a distraction. And we know that when we have these large-scale man camps come into our, air, into our territories, the rate of abuse of the local women and children goes up 
300%. And so this is the environment. This is the historic decades of us versus them, of us always being part of them as indigenous people that has created this situation. But so we're here today, you know, instead of getting caught up in what is a paralyzing situation where you can look at this and think, what do we do? Even the National Enquiry didn't come out with any real good recommendations about what we could do. So what do we do? The solution when we want to talk about it. And this is actually also my solution for how you work with a populist government, how we work with a Doug Ford Ontario. Because we have to show the broader Canadian society that improving conditions for Indigenous people is not just a right thing to do. It's not just a liberal do-gooder, make us feel good about our history and right the past wrongs kind of thing, which is nice, but you know what? That's not going to fly with a whole lot of people. It's not just the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. Because if the upstream investments in Indigenous community, if kids are in their homes and families are together, it saves the average taxpayer money in the long run. And that's what we've been trying to educate the government. So with the Ontario Native Women's Association in our programs, we've had almost 6,000 community events with 300 partnerships, 1,400 community members served, you know, 77,000 participants. And because of the work we're doing, 156 children reunified with their families, 29, almost 30 women who have left human trafficking, has saved the provincial government $50 million this year alone. So that's not just the right thing to do. This is a smart thing to do. Investing in Indigenous communities, investing in keeping Indigenous families together is the smart thing to do. Now, there's a lot of you sitting there going, how the heck does she come up with $50 million? That's not, no. Well, OK, I can show you. <laughs> I have staff who found me numbers. <laughs> if you look at the cost of doing nothing, the cost of not improving conditions for Indigenous people in our own country. The cost of homelessness per person per year, when we're looking at emergency shelters, up to 42,000 per year, up to 120,000 when you think about the cost of police having to take that homeless person, you know, they find them when they're freezing, ambulance trips, nights in the hospital, back out on the streets, back into the hospital. If we add that up, we see that it's up to 120,000 a year. So that means if 35 people are taken off the street, and put into homes that we provided just in the city of Thunder Bay, we have saved four and a half million to the provincial government just this year alone. Is that not worth, I mean, that's, that just makes sense. That gets you votes, right, of taxpayers? Child welfare. We know at $113 per day, if you have special needs kids, it's $15,000 per month is the price for taking care of those kids in foster families rather than supporting our own families in order to keep our children. And there's lots of times where there's relatives for customary care where there may be an auntie or a grandparent who could take in those kids and they just need a little bit of money. Because quite frankly, those, you know, you know what it's like as seniors trying to provide, pay for your own needs, much less a couple of kids who eat you out of house and home. My in-laws actually used to say, instead of sending her with an overnight bag, how about you just send her with a Zares gift card and, you know, for Loblaws, because <laughs> apparently she ate them at a house and home in the weekend she spent there. But you put this together for the 156 kids that were reunified with their families, saved 28 million per year to the provincial government. That's money they didn't have to spend putting our kids in foster homes. That's quite a side from the good for those families being held together. Human trafficking for the, 39, the 29 women who, were, who left human trafficking, 17 million in savings in emergency room visits, ambulance, hospital stays, medical care, victim support, incarceration. So that's how we come up with $50 million. Actually, $50 million. In my family, we went to a horse auction this summer. And my daughters, they kept saying, like, so what's the trick here? Like, so we just put our hand up and say, 50 million. And I was like, God, just please don't talk. If I take you to auctions, don't say anything. We ended up coming home with a horse, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Only $900, but you know, still not my intention. But once it's sold to you, who knows? You can't take them back. It's yours. So what's the solution? 
As we said, upstream investments in Indigenous community. Yes, everybody in this room, you did not participate in the oppression of Indigenous people, but because we are all treaty people. We often think of Indigenous rights, we think of treaty rights as rights for Indians. Right? That makes sense. That's what they are. There's, there, was, there was a book a long time ago actually called Treaties Are for Indians. Because everybody sees the treaties as outlining the rights of the Indian peoples. They don't realize that there were two signatories to every treaty. There were two sides to every treaty. And so there are descendants who have rights on both sides of every treaty. And if you are living in Canada, if you own a home in Canada, if you have gone to school in Canada and you have the privilege of living here, you have the privilege, you are the descendants and the privileges of those treaties. You have rights under those treaties. And we need to start thinking of our country that way, start thinking of us all as treaty people, not as Indians and Canadians. Not that treaty rights are somehow in opposition to the rights of average Canadians, whether we're in Oka or Ipperwash or wherever the latest land claim is about. We need to recognize that we all have obligations, that we're all benefiting from those treaties. Somebody gave me an example when they said, you know, here we are, there's the local wild rice situation in near Peterborough where the local people are harvesting wild rice, um, but the wild rice grows in the areas out in front of a lot of big fancy cottages. And so the cottages are quite upset about this because they say it's destroying their enjoyment of their cottages. And they likened it to, you know, if you buy this nice little cottage and somebody comes in and moves in next door and builds one of those monster cottages and their deck is completely blocking out the light for your cottage and, you know, that's injustice, that's not right, that shouldn't be allowed. And that's how they're seeing the situation of, you know, the local Indigenous peoples being allowed to harvest, uh, being allowed to seed and harvest wild rice in these waterways that they want to be using for their sea dews and their speedboats and stuff like that. But we said that's the wrong metaphor, that's the wrong example. It's not that we have come and built some monster home, fancy, expensive home next to you. It's more like, imagine you're selling your home. And a couple of days before closing, the people who have agreed to, to purchase, you know, all the papers are lined up, the mortgage is approved, you're just waiting for your keys. They show up, they move in, and they lock you in the basement. And you don't get your money. And you've now been in the basement for a really long time. A couple generations now you've been in the basement. And those people are still living upstairs. They don't even remember how those people in the basement got there. But those people in the basement are still living there. And that's what upstream investment is about. It's time to open that door to invite the people in the basement up to be part of us so that they can work, so that they can thrive, not just survive in our own territories. So that we can provide and we can support our own families because we're losing out on so much potential in this country, so much knowledge, especially right now as we're being threatened with climate change. Traditional Indigenous knowledges have so much to offer in terms of changing how we look at things, in terms of how we protect the water. The role of Indigenous women is about protecting the water, those life waters. And so when we're looking at this, that's how we need to think. We need to change that narrative of us against them. We need to start seeing Canada as though we're all treaty people. We're all descendants and beneficiaries of those treaties one way or the other, and we all have obligations to make Canada a just society for everybody under those treaties. But we can't do this alone. Even if I was to gather up every Indigenous man, woman, and child, put them in buses, drive them to Ottawa, which would be a logistical feat and a nightmare in itself, we would get to Ottawa and we would still be just a whisper. We would still be such a small voice, a special interest group, which is the way Indigenous rights are always framed. We would still be such a small voice, it wouldn't make a difference. It's not until we have everybody see that we're all treaty people, that this benefits everybody. And if we all take this up and we all speak out, then that's when society changes. That's when things happen for our people. And there's days I don't want to do this anymore. You know, there's days we're talking about violence in our communities. We're talking about the number of kids in care. It's too much. You don't want to talk. I don't, I don't want to think about it anymore. I want to go crawl under a rock somewhere where the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women doesn't, it's not on the radar. I'd probably have to elbow Stephen Harper out of the way to find a spot under that rock. <laughs> but we can't become overwhelmed. We have to keep doing something. And there is hope. 
There is hope. We have seen when Canadians come together and make different choices. Because if you're not part of the solution, then you are part of the problem. And we all have a role to play as we change the situation. And most importantly, that role is opening our eyes, is educating ourselves and learning what's going on around us. Because it's silence and ignorance that have allowed this situation to continue. And it's racism and sexism have created the situation. <coughs> but you're all sitting here thinking, what can I do? I'm not an MP. I'm not even an MPP. I'm not even a church minister, probably. <laughs> not a lawyer, not a judge. What can I do? And I have that conversation a lot. You know, when I'm thinking about how do we make this country safer for our young Indigenous children, our young girls especially, I'll tell you a story. I went to Charlottetown one summer, and as, as, as a typical super mom moment, I had been promising my children all summer that we would have time to get away together. And of course, I didn't, because I was constantly doing work. And so now it's the last week of the summer, and we have to go to Charlottetown for the premier's meeting. And so in a move of glaring brilliance, I thought, fine, we will have a road trip. We will drive from Port Hope to Charlottetown in a minivan with my children and we will pretend this is a fun family vacation. <laughs> and we're driving, and they, uh, part of their goal is to stop at every cheesy tourist trap and gift shop from Toronto to Charlottetown and to poke each other incessantly every two miles the whole way there because somebody crossed the imaginary line that divides the vehicle in the middle of there on my side now. And so, because I'm just trying to get there, because I got to work, and now I have to do a CBC interview, and I, you know, I don't have time to stop and pull over and do this, so I'm like, okay, super mom moment. I'm going to keep driving, with hands free, of course, just in case anybody broadcasts this on the radio. I, hands free, I'm not <laughs> dialing while I'm driving. And the kids are in the car, and I have to do a radio interview. So I warn them. You know, mommy has to do an interview now. This is going to be live radio. You cannot say anything. Right? Like you have to be dead silent or there will be no whale watching, there will be no more gift shops, there will be no more potato chip factory, nothing. So I have threatened them within an inch of their lives, they're very silent, I get on, I'm you know, doing my interview and they come on and you know, I talk very professionally, coming on the show about you know, the high rates of violence against indigenous women, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, human trafficking. And at the end of the interview, you know, on CBC and their best CBC voice, they're all like, well, thank you very much, Miss Laval Harvard, for being on the show. And I'm all, well, thank you very much for having me. And, and then click. And then there's dead silence. And this has not happened since we were in Toronto. So I know there's something going on. So I look in the rearview mirror, and the kids are there, these three girls with these big owl-like eyes. And I thought, uh-oh, they just heard that whole conversation. I didn't think that one through. And my daughter, who was about 11 at the time, she looks up at me and she says, Mom, we're indigenous, right? And I said, yeah, she knows that. And I'm a girl, right? <laughs> Obviously. And she looks at me and she says, does that mean I'm in danger? And I wanted to say, absolutely not. There is, I would never let anything happen to you. But if everything I've told you is true, I can't make that promise, unless I lock her in the closet until she's 40. <laughs> and then CAS will be after me for doing that. <laughs> That's what our girls are looking at. And that's why we have to keep doing this. So on days when I don't want to keep thinking about this, I was actually had one of those days at the UN in New York City. And I was literally like, I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm going home. And this little tiny woman from Peru came up. And she says, I don't understand why you're having such a problem with this. And she says, you have that hummingbird spirit. And I thought she was making fun of me because I'm kind of small and feisty and so are hummingbirds. And, and she says, no, she says, I've seen you walking through here. You know, you have the hummingbird on your skirt because I had this skirt with the hummingbird embroidered on it. And I had these little silver earrings that were hummingbirds. And she says, you have that spirit. And I didn't have the heart to tell her. I wore the earrings because my mom gave them to me for Christmas and I was going to see her later that day. So it's important that you wear the gift you got. <laughs> Show your appreciation. And I really didn't have the heart to tell her I wore that skirt so much because it has a stretchy waistband and it was the only one that fit me after being eating restaurants for two weeks in New York City. 
And she says, no, you have that hummingbird spirit. And she says, I'll tell you a story from my people from a long time ago. And she says, back, back long time in history, when the forests were burning, kind of like they are now, forests were burning. And all the people had run away. And all the animals that could get away had got away. And they're standing there watching their homes burn. And while they're all standing there watching, there's this little tiny hummingbird. And this hummingbird is flying from the river and picking up one drop of water and flying back to that fire and dropping one drop of water. And he's back and forth, back and forth. And his little tiny tail is getting singed. And all the animals just look at him and laugh. And they said, hummingbird, what the hell do you think you're doing? And without missing a beat with his little tiny singed wings, that hummingbird said, I am doing what I can. And that's what this is about, because one drop at a time, you can make a difference. We have seen it. You can change society. We know you do one thing, one drop at a time. Thousands and millions of drops becomes a flood that changes the very landscape we live in. One drop at a time over hundreds of years can wear away even the hardest of rock. That kind of persistence. And that's what we need to remember in times when we hear people building walls and we hear talk about us versus them and those people need to appreciate. We remember that if we each do one thing, if we each be that hummingbird, then we do have hope that we can change society into a more just society and the society that we are all proud to be part of. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, the two lovely women I had the pleasure of sharing lunch with today, uh, I think a lot of what you said um, might help us in some of the existential questions that we were working through um, over the lunch hour. And uh, I think, it, as I'd said, it's a very timely throughout the process of this conference uh, to, be t to be touching on themes um, that, that you shared with us, especially thinking about you know, the connections of these massive systems um, and cultures of patriarchy patriarchy and colonialism, how they reflect themselves in populism. This morning we heard about the influence of religion and how there are patriarchal and subjugation of women often in those conversations. Uh, what I was a part of uh, before lunch, you know, hearing about potential attacks that will be coming uh, to activists, to the communities, um, what we'll see with our public service and particularly with public servants and unions, um, many of which that are dominated by uh, professionals filled mainly with women, our nurses, our teachers, uh, even in the civil service. And so this focus um, on the role of women and the hope that I think a lot of us can gain from the resilience and the drops of water uh, that we can all um, contribute to that. And if uh, you'll all humor me as I see some hands coming up, um, while, we, while you are also formulating your questions, um, I did notice uh, something that was in one of your slides in terms of an action that you had taken around uh, these 26 circles of care. And I was wondering if you could speak just a little bit about that in terms of um, the actions that people can do, you know, writing RMPs and, and, and those sorts of things, but also these convenings and these conversations and what that looked like. Absolutely. So there's two things going on. The 26 Circles of Care. Uh, circles of Care is our new program model that instead of having you know, a woman, she has to go over to some housing association to look at housing, you know, and then she, she 
she's come into our office for maybe education, so then she's gonna have to pack up her kids and go across town for that. It's about making hubs where we bring everybody in as teams so that we have people who are working on employment, people who are working on education, social workers, the housing people, you know, we go down the hall to the housing people, so that when, because when we find very often a woman coming in with presenting with one issue, once you start to peel it back, there are so many layers preventing her from addressing that one issue that when we function in circles as teams to support a woman in a more holistic way rather than as silos where we're like, you know what, I'm only in housing, that's not my problem. It's, it's about creating teams of care around women so that we can hold families together and have them the, the future they need. But it's also about changing our conception of how we do things. When we talk about circles of care, it's about caring for families. It's about recognizing that you know, that child, we often talk about how, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a woman to raise it, to run a village, I think. <laughs> so it's about, you know, ensuring our women have voice, ensuring that our women who are doing that caring in our families, which is what is holding up our entire nation, that our women have that support to continue to be providing that care for the children, for the grandchildren, for the parents and grandparents. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so we will take questions, we'll take three at a time. And I've been asked by our mic runners, uh, first of all, if you could hold your hands up high and keep them up um, or as, as the answer is being wrapped up, um, just to hold, uh, keep your hand up so that the mic runners can see you. So we'll start up there in uh, the back corner for one. Um, is there anyone over on this side that's got, uh, got some questions? Um, okay, so up here in front. Um, so up at the back corner will will be the first one. And Just to make you get your steps in, I think they're concerned <laughs> about your physical fitness here today. Excellent. And then a third question um, here. Okay. So, so it's the gentleman in the back with a sort of red and blue striped shirt there. Uh, first of all, just uh, again, th thank you very much for the. You're very welcome. Inspiring. Uh, and very uh, informative uh, a presentation. My question is uh, a very specific one, and it has to do with uh, with uh, all the communities, particularly the isolated uh, indigenous communities that lack potable water. And my question is, I don't know whether you uh, to what degree you know uh, you're informed about this issue in the sense of this. How is it that there's no potable water available in the sense of, isn't it possible to drill wells? That's not blaming anyone, you realize. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, so that even if you drill a well or you have a stream going through that particular bit of land, to what degree have the waters been poisoned mm -hmm. or uh, anyway made undrinkable <laughs> so because of surrounding uh, so-called development? It could be oil and gas, it could be mining, mm -hmm. it could be a hundred things. Absolutely. You, can you, and I think you've uh, got it right it's there. It's just something, something like that because then it puts the whole water situation into another context. Thank you. Um, up, up front, I'll get you. That's okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Sorry, An Annika, did you have? Oh, you're waiting for a microphone. Sorry. Uh, yeah, if you could just have your hand up. <laughs> or, <laughs> I just, I just want to say. From the bottom of my heart, I came here thinking, oh, I just listened to Sally Armstrong. Oh, I'm just reading Juval Noel uh, Arari's trilogy. I know it all. I just have to promote it. You spoke, and I feel I'm going up in flames. I feel so inspired by this. And there are about 39 or 49 things that I, I quickly jotted down. I'm going to talk to my friends who still don't understand it. And I am still learning each day. Thank you. 
But the issue, the issue of the residential schools, you, you kind of explained about the terrible hard feelings. And then you said in one sentence, what did we really do? One half of 1% was so-called given or not taken to the Indians. Maybe you can speak more forcefully to it. I already am totally motivated by what you are saying. I, I will leave this room a new person. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, sorry. Based on whichever definition, a uh, popular definition of woman is being used, of uh, the indigenous people who are missing and murdered, 30% of them are female assigned or female identified. What is the value of focusing more on people who are at less risk of violence in indigenous communities? Sorry, can you explain that question a little better? 70% of missing and murdered indigenous people were slapped on the butt by a doctor and said it's a boy. So what, however you want to call them, men or male assigned. Why didn't what, we what focus is, on them? Is that the question? Yes. Why don't okay. 2,000 missing and murdered indigenous people matter as much as 1,100? Thank you. OK. All right, so first question, clean water. I think you kind of had the answer in your question. Some of the communities, the water is so toxic that no amount of boiling cleans it, that, I mean, even in Curve Lake, which is right next to Peterborough, where I'm working right now, you know, the surrounding lakes and streams have been contaminated by previous historic industrial that has settled to the bottom. So there's, there's toxins in the bottom of the waters. But because communities have been crowded into a very small land mass on this little peninsula of Curve Lake, they've in fact looked at why don't we just have septic and wells? But because the n amount of people in that small area, there's not enough land mass to actually provide everybody with septic and wells because the water table can't hold it. And this is a really big problem because this is not just about clean water. You know, when we're trying to talk to the chief about economic development, why don't we, you know, we want to go up there and talk about opening a museum and doing this and having, you know, a conference center. You can't do those things if you don't have clean water. You can't do those things for the people who are coming and are going to expect to be able to have water. So that it fundamentally connects, not that clean water is one of those sort of non-starter issues. If you don't have that, then it prevents prog progress in a whole lot of other areas. And a lot of them, it is, you know, whether we're looking at grassy narrows, you know, contaminated with mercury, where it's our communities that have such toxic stuff in our water tables, that it's, it's going to take some, some serious political will and commitment to addressing that situation. But it has to be addressed before you can move on to other areas. The um, one half of 1%, thank you so much. You know, when we talk about the residential schools, one of the things that really occurs to me lately, having just come through Remembrance Day, my whole life I grew up hearing people say, why don't you people just get over it? That was in the past. Nobody would ever march down to the Cenotaph in Ottawa and up to one of those guys in their uniforms with their medals and say, why don't you just get over it? That was a long time ago. Nobody says that. That's why it's important, because we can't know where we're going if we don't know where we've come from. Even my Google won't give me directions unless I can tell you where I'm starting. We need to know. We need to know that history. And we need to acknowledge that and accept that if we are going to forge a relationship together as a nation. And when we talk about reconciliation, I'm not talking about tolerance for other people. That concept actually really bothers me. Because quite frankly, I tolerate a toothache. I tolerate my in-laws sort of when I have to. <laughs> not really. <laughs> not very well. I don't want to be tolerated. I want to be understood, I want to be respected, I want to be embraced as part of this nation, not tolerated as somebody who's allowed to live here in my own lands, in that half of a percent of what's left. And people, for people to understand that, you know, I, I tell my students, 
If you think about the impact this has on our communities and why there's so much poverty and why there's problems with the water tables, if you have some farmer outside of Edmonton who has 100 acres and he's got about 12 kids, so this is a historic farm. This was a while ago. Nobody has that many kids anymore unless you're on that TV show with the 20 kids and counting or whatever they are. So, you know, you've got this farmer, he's got 100 acres. And just to make my math easier, less than a half of a percent. So he is now, the government comes, expropriates, says, okay, Frank, all you've got left, the little town lot, you've got less than a half an acre. How is he going to feed his family? How is he going to provide enough food? How is he going to grow enough food for all of those kids when he's gone from 100 acres to less than a half? So you can understand how hard it is for our communities to provide for our members, to survive, and how they became dependent on government rations, how they became dependent on the government when you have less than one half of 1% of your original territories. How you can't have wells and septic systems when you have less than one half of 1% and people are crowded into such small little pockets of land that the water table can't hold that number of wells and septic. The third question, I had somebody actually come up to me when we were working towards the inquiry saying exact, well, two of them. One was a non-Indigenous man whose daughter had been murdered absolutely tragic. Everybody matters. Nobody has ever suggested that anybody who was not included in the inquiry isn't as important or doesn't matter. That's, cer that, that's, that's certainly not the case. What we're saying, you know, he, he came up with pictures of his daughter and said, doesn't she matter? Don't non-Indigenous girls matter? And I said, absolutely they do. Their experience is fundamentally different. Absolutely they do. And I will sign the petition and I will help you get an investigation into what's happened to non-Indigenous women. I will absolutely help do that. But, and I was also, you know, members of my own community come forward and said, you know, what about our men? What about the extremely high number of men and Indigenous men and boys who have been, who have been killed? who have been victims of violence, who have been murdered. And absolutely they matter. But if we add Indigenous men and boys to the inquiry, and we add non-Indigenous women to the inquiry, really the only people we're leaving out is non-Indigenous non men, and it becomes an inquiry so broad that your outcomes are meaningless, and they're not actionable. So we need multiple inquiries. We absolutely, men matter, absolutely boys matter, absolutely. One of the challenges is that the experience of Indigenous women and the experience of Indigenous men in terms of the types of, homo of murders that happen is different. It's, it's a lot of domestic violence, um, women being murdered in the homes, in relationships, and, and, um, and, and we use the term relationship loosely because that's, you know, sometimes it's acquaintance, sometimes it's uh, a pimp, sometimes it's somebody they work with, you know, they, they use the term relationship very loosely. But from the research that we've seen, for the men and boys, there tends to be a lot more gangs and guns. So, and that's not judging in any way. That's saying that you need two different research, if you want to call it, two different methods of looking into it, so that you can actually get the kind of targeted outcomes that are actionable at the end. Excellent. Thank you. I'm sorry, actually, Ronnie, I'd invite you to come up at the, um, once we've wrapped up, we're just a little bit past time. Um, thanks in part to the wonderful stories uh, that you were able to share with us. When I said, I asked, why am I telling the story about my mother? I never did answer that question, did I? <laughs> the reason and I'm telling you that is because it's an example of how one person can make a change. She stood up against the Canadian government, and even when they lost it in the Supreme Court, they went to the UN, and eventually the laws of Canada were changed. It took them 50 years. But one little Ojibwe woman from Northern Ontario changed the laws of Canada when she stood up. Thank you for your humor, your passion, your emotion. We all appreciate it very much. Um, and yeah, so we've got a break for the next 12 minutes uh, to find your way to the two breakout sessions this afternoon, and uh, continued conversation.